KNON 89.3 FM in Dallas and Fort Worth, the voice of the people. Business owners, tell KNON's listeners about your business. You can put your business or event on KNON. KNON currently has space available to run announcements for you. Tell KNON's listeners about your goods, services, nightclub, concert, or event. Help keep the voice of the people on the air while putting your information on the air. KNON's been named the number one radio station in Dallas by both the Dallas Observer and D Magazine. Put your business with Dallas's number one station. Call now for more information at 214-828-9500, extension 227, or extension 233. For more information, go to KNON.org and click on the Run Spots on KNON page. It's a great way for your business to support community radio while letting more people know about you. This is the work of me. I'm Gene Lance. The number is 972-647-1893. And I'm here with Bonnie Mathias. Good morning. Got a whole bunch of stuff to for you to do. Man, <laughs> and you know, your, today is, is the, your to-do list. Today is the big march on Washington in Washington. Yeah, They're absolutely. having a big and one. A APRI convention. Here. And a bunch of stuff happening yes. here in conjunction with... Uh, uh, what's happening in Washington with the I Have a Dream speech. After this radio show, I'll be going down on Jefferson Street in Oak Cliff to leaflet for our Labor Day activities on March 31st, because on March 31st at 10 o'clock in the morning, we're meeting at the Texas Theater, the historic Texas Theater, and uh, we'll be carrying out several Labor Day activities. First, a hearing on low-wage workers, then a march for Labor Day and then a hot dog picnic and it's all free you can come into the Texas theater for free it's worth it just to go in there because it's the historic Texas theater isn't isn't Congressman Mark Vesey speaking Congressman Mark Vesey right. will head the list at 10 o'clock uh, we'll also have representative Roberto Alonzo and everybody's favorite speaker from the Texas AF of LCO attorney Rick Levy Starting with today, though, a bunch of stuff. Starting at 11.20 today in Grand Prairie on College and Church Streets, the 50th anniversary of the March on Washington event at the Grand Prairie City Hall Plaza at the Liberty Bell near Northwest 4th. Grand Prairie citizens and deputy registers are sponsoring, and here's the phone number, 972-262-5903. Hurry out to Grand Prairie today at 11.20 and celebrate with Grand Prairie on the I Have a Dream speech. August 24th, National Dallas in NAACP Martin Luther King Freedom Fund Scholarship Banquet. Call Clara McDade. You have to get tickets for this. Call Clara McDade, 972-225-8030. 972-225-8030. In honor of the anniversary of the 19th Amendment and in recognition of the persistence of gender inequality in America, Dallas Equal Rights supporters will march on August 26th. This is Monday, I think. Monday, right, yes. You're going to this one. Yes, sir. Okay, and this is in Below Garden Park at 1014 Main Street, Dallas, from 7 p.m. until 9 p.m. Didn't get a phone number, but uh, be down there at 1014 Main Street in Dallas from 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. on Wednesday, August the 26th to stand up for women's rights. And right. It, and we need it right now, don't yes, we? Yes, we do. And that park is the new park downtown. Between It's it's bordered with Commerce and Main, uh, and it's there's parking. It's, it's caddy, kind of on the north end of downtown, right? Yeah, and it's Caddy Corner Down where from... where the police uh, station used to be. Yes. The main police station. Yes. It's, it's not, not far from now, Dallas Morning News. All mm -hmm. that is down there. So there down you there, where the Klan had their rally. Yes, in, uh, yes, that's the in, place. Uh, 1993. <laughs> that's the as place. You <laughs> okay, well that'll be uh, on the 26th, and also on the 26th, Women's Equality Day, sponsored by the League of Women Voters of Irving, with Speaker Dr. Elba Garcia, who's down yes. at Dallas County Commissioner, uh, and the number for that one is 214. 683-8230. This just goes on and on. Yeah. Wednesday, August the 28th, let Freedom Ring Bell Ringing, the 50th anniversary of the I Have a Dream. Bell Ringing at 2 o'clock p.m. on August 28th. And this is a memorial service, right. not a rally. And it's planned for Thanksgiving Square in downtown Dallas. There's a cathedral or a, a chapel or something down there, right? Yes. So I think it'll probably be indoors at Thanksgiving Square. This is sponsored by... Uh, uh, 
Congresswoman Eddie Bernice Johnson, yes. and a really good one to go to. I know my union president is urging everybody to go, and mm -hmm. so is the new head of the Dallas AFL-CIO, Mark York. He told me specifically to get the word out about this business on Thanksgiving Square uh, at 2 p.m. on August 28th, Wednesday. Now, uh, that evening at 6 p.m., organized 545. labor 545. workshop. 5.45. Hmm? 5.45. 5.45. They changed it. Five forty-five. Five forty-five. At five forty-five that evening, on we're still talking about August twenty-eighth. Uh, there was an organized labor workshop at Friendship West Baptist Church, twenty twenty West Wheatland. Memorial service then begins at seven p.m. And it so will be everybody's invited at seven. Yes, yes. And trade unionists are supposed to be there at five forty-five. And we actually anybody is invi invited to come uh, oh, at five forty-five because we're really I think it's kind of a let us tell you what labor is really all about. So it's a workers' thing. yes. Yes. Uh, leading up to workers play okay uh 10 current or recently fired walmart workers were just arrested in washington dc mm -hmm. for peaceful civil, civil disobedience and uh they will be having a rally on september the 5th yes uh, that's on on retail road and i'll be publicizing that right here on yes. KNO. the workers beat does this kind of stuff and nobody else does that's to right. tell you what working class things are happening that you can get involved in that's and right. as soon as we get through this show We'll be down on Jefferson Street handing out leaflets for Labor Day activities that, that are going to take place on August 31st at the Texas Theater at 10 o'clock in the morning. Now, let's talk. We're talking about what's I, about to happen. I have one more event. One more event, and that is on September the 10th at Zan Holmes Community Life Center at 7 p.m. Mm -hmm. This is going, this is stand up sign up speak out about the affordable care act you're going to find out how you qualify who qualifies how to sign up because folks you start signing up for this on october the first so you're supposed to find out about it now. yes you've got to find out you've got to find out who's eligible who's not eligible uh and if you're not eligible we want you to make sure that you're registered to vote and vote so that you can become eligible max crockmall wrote an op-ed about the march on washington and he happens to be here yay max crockmall the history professor from texas christian university yes sir uh, go ahead max tell us about the march on washington well it, it's great to be here today with you um the march on washington it, it's great that there's all these memorial services happening and 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 other remembrances of this mom, this important event and and most importantly another uh, uh, reenactment of the March on Washington taking place in Washington, D.C. this week. Uh, it's often a misunderstood march, and mm -hmm. the most important thing that we forget is that it, the full title of it that was called the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom, and uh, that it included uh, a very much a working class agenda, working class participants, uh, but we often just remember those few words that Dr. King said, great words. But, but part of a much larger movement, not just for racial justice, but also for economic opportunity. And an event that was kicked off by a trade unionist. Yes, sure. A. Philip Randolph organized uh, the event. And in fact, it grew out of his organizing going way back to the first March on Washington movement during World War II. Uh, a. Philip Randolph, a great trade unionist, the founder of the Brother of, Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters, um, which is an all-black uh, railroad union. Uh, he organized the March on Washington movement during World War II that uh, pushed for the desegregation of the defense industries uh, mm -hmm. and also of the military and forced uh, President Roosevelt to uh, issue an executive order that, that opened up defense industries to African Americans, p other people of color, uh, and women as well, and created uh, not a great enforcement mechanism, but more than had ever existed before. What was that the FE? The FEPC, the Fair FEPC. Employment Practices Committee, mm -hmm. uh, and and then commission, and and so that you know we we see that as a moment when when people of color, when women were able to break into heavy industry really for the first time. Um, so it started then, and then and then by the 1963 march, uh, Randolph is again organizing a, a movement of of black working people centered in New York City. Um, the Negro American Labor Congress was was one main organization, and and many of the foot soldiers in that march on Washington came uh, out of that group uh, and out of that movement. So there's a great new book by Will William Jones, William P. Jones. It's called The March on Was Washington, recently released, and it tells the story in, in much greater detail. But we we 
we see movement uh, marches happening you know here locally as you just mentioned in grand prairie and in dallas and in washington and it's a great remembrance but but for me what's important is that we also remember that economic side of the movement that that sometimes gets lost. Yes. I have an obscure question about the March on Washington <coughs> in 1963 because A. Philip Randolph was kind of the slender fella who was standing next to Dr. Martin Luther King. As, he, as you see those videos of him speaking, then uh, you see a guy wearing a little hat. And I'm wondering if A. Philip Randolph was wearing a paper hat because I, in, in, back in back in the day, Industrial workers wore paper hats, <laughs> but he had on a hat. It was either a kepi, the kind that soldiers wore in World War II, or it was a paper hat. And I've always kind of wondered if he wore a paper hat in honor of all the industrial workers over the last century or two who wore paper hats to work. You know, I, I have not heard that one way or the other, but... It's certainly worth looking into. I think he's the only guy that was on the podium with a hat. Well, you know, Nancy Nancy Hall has uh, put together a board uh, as you walk into our hall to promote the, the commemoration on the 28th at Friendship West. Uh, and he, there, are, there are photographs of Charlton Heston, mm -hmm. uh, Rita Moreno, uh, Harry Belafonte, Harry Belafonte uh, Paul Newman. Mm-hmm. All they coming off the plane and then walking to through the uh, into the crowd. Uh -huh. uh, it's, and I was, you know, because all I can think of when I think of Charlton Heston is, you know, the NRA from my cold dead hands. But they, but he helped. <laughs> Uh, yeah. On, uh, on yeah. August 28th of 1963, he was there. That was that was a surprise. Mm -hmm. And another interesting story about that that date was that there was a march in Austin on, at the same moment. Really? Um, and several, at least a thousand people, probably more uh, African Americans, mostly marched from uh, East Austin, which was a black neighborhood, uh, down past the Capitol, and then rallied uh, in I think it was Wool Ridge Park in downtown. And there was a sizable contingent of Mexican Americans there, and also labor people who came out to support them and they were all aligned in, in, in a group that was um, engaging in, in a large voter registration effort and in a in a larger battle against the then governor John Connolly to try to force him to integrate Texas even ahead of the federal legislation right uh, so I, I wish we were commemorating that also but it's yeah. a little known chapter of our history here that that I just wanted to share you, that's one thing I've noticed about you Max is that you find the good part the good things that have happened because there were people fighting all the time when people look back uh, prior to, uh, to 1965 you don't know, say those were the dark days of, of the civil rights movement and they were but there were people fighting there were people doing things and and you've dug dug out some of this and especially and some of them were trade unionists sure yeah i mean there's a long tradition of of community organizing in texas and of labor organizing and civil rights organizing they all overlapped mm -hmm. and and even in the darkest days in the late 40s the 50s the 60s uh, you see people going out and trying to organize their communities their work sites uh, their schools small political clubs whatever it might be and and there is this tradition of resistance of course there's a much larger history of of repression and of things gone wrong and battles lost uh, but I do think it's important to, to recover those efforts, um, even if they, they weren't winning efforts, uh, mm -hmm. it, so that we, we can think about what worked in the past, what didn't. Well, when, uh, when, when things really began to pop in, in 1954, I guess, uh, they, had, they were building on the efforts of many other people who had, who had always pushed for civil rights since since before the Civil War. Yeah, so uh, I assume you're talking about the Brown versus Board decision of 54 when the Supreme Court uh, orders the desegregation of schools. That that came on the heels of a number of cases. Um, most important precedent was the Sweat versus Painter case that desegregated the University of Texas. Mm -hmm. uh, well, Sweat was a trade unionist. He yes. was a, um, a postal worker, a letter carrier, a member of the National Alliance of Letter Carriers. And in fact, his father was one of the founding members and was founded in his house mm -hmm. uh, in, in Houston. So um, Sweat was part of this, this broader labor and civil rights movement that was anchored in the NAACP and in trade unions uh, there in Houston that dated back into the 40s. Uh, and it was a very vibrant chapter. It also gave of us, uh, you know, helped to underpin, did all the fundraising, a lot of the work on the ground for the, the Smith versus Allwright decision that, that, that overturned the white primary 
uh, in the Democratic Party and made it possible for African Americans to, to participate meaningfully in politics in the state and, I understand and, and that nationwide. That, I understand that that lawsuit was won in El Paso, wasn't it? <coughs> no, but, Smith, Smith comes out of Houston also. I mean, maybe it was an El Paso courtroom, but it's... It, I think it, it was in El Paso, but I, but I have always thought that the Dallas NAACP was very strong and was very strongly involved both in sweat and and in the in the lawsuit that overturned the white primary yeah i'm i'm, I'm sure it was it, it it certainly supported it uh you know they did both come out of the houston branch mm-hmm. um but the dallas branch was the home to the the state headquarters of the naacp uh which was revived in the 30s and uh and, and certainly the dallas branch moving forward under the leadership of of maceo smith and and attorney wj bill durham uh, were, were hugely important fighting th- those causes really from the 30s forward into the into the 1970s. Not everybody knows this, but uh, A. Maceo Smith had quite a bit to do with organizing my union. Really? Uh, the union was organized in 1943. Uh, that's when they first got their first contract, but they actually started trying uh, back in, say, 41. Right after the victory at Ford, uh, in East Dallas, which was a legal victory. Mm-hmm. It wasn't a victory of thousands of people, but right after that victory, they came over and started trying to organize North American aviation in Grand Prairie, and uh, without much success. And the company was able to stop the drive by taking the the guy that was responsible for it and, and stationing him somewhere so that he couldn't move around the plant anymore. So he went to A. Maceo Smith, and uh, as he told me this story himself a few months before he died, uh, Jack Anderson told me that, uh, uh, and he used the N-word profusely. You know, he wasn't exactly a civil rights activist himself, but he's, he said he went to the head of the uh, Black Chamber of Commerce. It was called the Negro Chamber of Commerce at that time. And, uh, uh, and that guy, he couldn't remember A. Maceo Smith's name, but he said that guy, and he called him the N-word, uh, told all of the African Americans working at North American Aviation that they needed to help organize this union and that they could get uh, sign-up cards from Jack Anderson. And Jack Anderson was not able to move around the plant because they had stationed him somewhere. And uh, so he gave out the cards to the trash handlers because the trash handlers oh. moved around throughout the plant. Sure. And he said, that's how they did it. And then in summary, and this is a quote, he said, so ends organized our union that was uh that was a, a wow. role that a maceo smith had in in, wow. uh, in the trade union movement well and and i must say there is a um the sweat family is also here in dallas mm-hmm. uh heman sweat uh is uh, a cwa member is that a fact yeah I, in fact he worked at yellow pages with me no kidding. Yeah, he's retired now, but uh, and he teaches at uh, DISD. How they get him away from the post office? Because he uh, you was know he never went to work for the post office, which is really funny. But he's now uh, he's CWA and uh, uh, I I would assume he's AFT as well. Mm-hmm. Your union goes way back, doesn't it? Yes. That's yes. the Communication Workers of America, and Bonnie's vice president. Yes, I am. CWA Local sixty two fifteen in Dallas. So we're looking at labor history, and you you mentioned that there were some very positive examples of these old days. Is there anybody that stands out, Max Krogmal, that uh, you you can think of that uh, kind of inspiring or anything? Well, sure. I, there's there are quite a few good stories in in the records of different people who. Um, you know, contributed to the struggle in one way or another. Well, let, we'll uh, get to that in a minute, but they're, now they're playing that music. You got the music have, on for us. They That's have right. To, no, we have to take a break. That means we have to <laughs> be right back, and you'll hear the story of uh, Labor's Heroes. Something seemed kind of strange. My body door was missing. There's a machine set in its place. I turned around and I asked my boss. Or uses a P.O. box, you send your pledge to KNON 5353 Maple Avenue, Suite 200, Dallas, Texas 75235. If you missed our pledge drive, you can still support community radio by pledging on the web at KNON.org. Your pledge only counts if you pay it. Remember, don't use the P.O. box, send that pledge to KNON 5353 Maple Avenue, Suite 200 in Dallas 75235. Be sure to put the name of the show you are supporting on the check or money order or the envelope questions about cano and pledge drive 214-828-9500 extension 234 
When they're gone, they're gone for good. This is Scott from Kano Wins Texas Blues Radio telling you don't miss out on some great blues. Kano Wins Texas Blues Radio Volume 5 Blues CD. It's a CD put together by real blues fans for real blues fans like you. Texas Blues Radio Volume 5 features great local blues from Michael J. and the Paul Bird Band, J.J. and the Detonators, the Chris Watson Band, the Two Tones, Rough Cut Blues Band, Jeff Stone with Charlie Love, Dave Millsap, Sir Loin and the Ass Kicking Machine, Tutu Jones, Blues Boy Bo, Buddy Whittington, Andrea Dawson, Kirkland James, Sonny Collie, and Johnny Red and the Roosters. Get a copy now at Forever Young Records in Grand Prairie, Record Town in Fort Worth, and in Dallas at Bill's Records. This is a Dallas Blues Collector's item. A very limited amount of vinyl copies can be found at Forever Young Records, the sponsor of this great blues project. CD downloads are available at cdbaby.com. Whether you get it as a download, on vinyl, or on CD, all the proceeds will benefit KNON. For more info on Texas Blues Radio Volume 5, visit knon.org. song by Fats Domino. Yes. Now, we were talking with Max Krokmal, I get his name wrong all the time, <laughs> about the heroes of, of labor that we might know. Who are some of them that, that you thought were inspiring? Well, it, you were talking a moment ago about the, the organizing of the, the local out at North American Aviation. Mm-hmm. And it made me think of one, which is the, the great late Francisco Pancho Medrano, mm-hmm. uh, who uh, is a Dallas native uh, and, and long... Uh, time activist with a huge um, you know hands in virtually everything organizing in civil rights in labor uh, in the Chicano movement in African American civil rights uh, in helping with the war on poverty just everywhere so so I can talk about Poncho a little and and just a quick bio if if for for those who don't know him Um, Poncho Medrano was was born I believe it was 1920 in Dallas, in, in the little Mexico barrio, which is um, kind of sandwiched right next to downtown and, and, the, and Harry Hines now. Um, and at that point, it was just a, a you know, very poor neighborhood, uh, didn't have any basic services. Pancho grew up barefoot and poor, uh, poor even for the small Mexican-American community that was in Dallas at the time. And in the Depression, he ended up dropping out of school um, because his principal found him a, a job working in a quarry that was being operated up near Bach, Bachman Lake uh, and and being run by the, the um, CCC or one of the New Deal agencies. Poncho ended up in a war training school that the WPA operated and, and managed to get a job out at the, the big aircraft plant in Grand Prairie. He was one of only a handful of Mexican-Americans who worked there. Um, and at first, he ran into some trouble about that. It wasn't exactly a, a, a progressive workplace, and and um, and Pancho, the story is that he you know did jobs that that normally two men did on his own. Uh, he was also a boxer and had come up uh, and learned how to box in Dallas, and and so he was always training for that. And he would run out to Grand Prairie to go to work every day. Wow! Um, and then run it's home about, at the it's end. About thirteen miles. Right. Yeah. Wow. And and. Um, and so, you know, he did help with organizing the union there between 41 and 43. Um, but what made that effective was that he, the, the company, in an attempt to keep the union from coming in, uh, gave the workers all these different recreational activities. And one of them was a boxing ring. <laughs> and, uh, and so Pancho uh, went and started boxing on his lunch break with other guys at the plant and one by one started beating them all up and, and earned their respect that way as a stand-up union man and a, a kind of macho guy. And um, they made him sergeant in arms of the union because uh, awesome. <laughs> right, he could throw anyone Perfect. out who shouldn't be there. Um, so he helped organize the place. Uh, you know, Later he was fired. Uh, he was able to be reinstated through the union and then became a, a, a staff member for the UAW, I believe, in 1963. Uh, and and unlike many union staff members, his job consisted not of doing representation at the at the work site or even new organizing. But he was uh, assigned to the citizenship department of the UAW, where he did wow. labor and uh, where he did political organizing and civil rights organizing, and and traveled all over the Southwest and and indeed the whole country, supporting one uh, civil rights or or political cause or another. So really fascinating story, um, and of course. 
here in, in, in Dallas, he, he helped to train his kids who, who uh, became leaders in the Chicano movement, yes. in, in the war on poverty, and, and, his and, and, and then ultimately electoral politics, right, yeah, and, and even now his grandkids um, serving on one elected board or another. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now, uh, one, one of his sons is on the school, one of his grandkids is on the school board. No, Adam is now a no, city, he's on the city council. He's now. a yeah. city councilman, well, yeah. and, and his daughter, his youngest daughter, well, you know, only daughter Pauline was the deputy mayor pro tem, still right. is. No, uh, she's just no, she's, she, or just she just termed out. Off, she right. termed just, out. She termed yeah. out, and yeah. Uh, yeah. Adam took the Adam spot. Adam took the spot. Yeah, there's but, uh, there's talk of her running for a county office. Yeah, so and we uh, shall see. And don't forget uh, Ricardo, Ricardo, and Roberto, who right. also mm-hmm. served on the school board and the mm-hmm. city council. Yeah, so. and, and and one great. I mean, we we talk. We understand that those are important positions now, but I th- I don't think. We always put together the connection between that and the earlier right. civil rights and labor yeah. organizing, right? right. And, and so Poncho is that link where, for decades, people living in these neighborhoods have been trying to win independent political power, real economic opportunity, and and it was, it was th- through the movement that they were able to start building those networks and building those bases, and and over in the same neighborhood. Um, Pancho and his wife Esperanza opened up a, a grocery store called Kika's Grocery, and they used that as a hub for community organizing. And then Robert also worked in the West Dallas uh, Community Center as part of the War on Poverty. They used that as a way to to meet more people, to register them to vote, and, and ultimately built this this huge electoral base um, that you know they they helped provide meaningful services for. Mm-hmm. And and it was really a, a, a tangible shift in power from the old days of of downtown white elites controlling everything to a new Dallas where where for the first time, you know, people of color did have some independent representation and, and access to city services. Wow. And Poncho actually has a post office named after yes, him. Yes, he does. And, and Esperanza has an elementary school named oh, for Oh, that's her. right. She because, does. That's because right. Because of uh, his, his friendship with Congresswoman Eddie Bernice Johnson. Sure. Yep. She got that post office out mm-hmm. in East Dallas named for him. I was at the ceremony. Oh, it was too. It was and, great. Uh, I didn't know all that. Poncho um, was a friend of mine. And I knew a lot of these stories because I knew Poncho. But I found one that even his kids didn't know after he died. It was in an obscure book about uh, Latinos, you know, and in history and uh, you, you've all heard the story of how Dolores Huerta and uh, Cesar Chavez started the uh, United Farm Workers out in California but not everybody knows that it was Pancho who brought them, brought them the money. Wow, yeah. no kidding! Yeah, the UAW gave $10,000 to get the United Farm Workers started, and it was Poncho who brought the money. Well, and, and beyond oh, that, wow. I'm, I'm pretty certain it was Poncho who helped bring money to the, the Great Crystal City organizing campaign in 1963, mm-hmm. uh, again, on behalf of the union, and also the or, or effort to organize the United Farm Workers in South Texas, in Star County, in 66 and 67. Poncho was down there uh, quite a bit. I've never out. quite understood it, but he told me about trying to organize for the cannery workers in Crystal wow. City. Yeah, and that was uh, way before, uh, way before what happened with uh, uh, the La Raza Unida when they took over the school board there. Well, sure. So the first, the f- the first real Crystal City revolt takes place in 1963, just a few months before the March on Washington, mm-hmm. uh, and it comes out of the out of the packing out of the, it was a Teamsters local, but it was in a packing union. Uh, uh-huh. it, they can they can the spinach, and. Uh, and so Poncho worked on that campaign, but more it came out of the Teamsters and out of a, a network of, of organizers led by Albert Pena of San Antonio. Mm-hmm. And so they sent people there to go and uh, get these Teamster members organized to vote. Um, and then also uh, there were some students and, and community activists led by one Jose Angel Gutierrez, who at the time I think was 17 or maybe 19 years old, uh, before he went to college and came back and started Raza Unida. And uh, <laughs> State Representative Roberto Alonso was involved yes. in all that yep. as you know, a teenager. I, I have lived in Texas now since steadily since 1983, and it, I have never known uh, i mean i know about poncho and i know about a few few things in texas but it's amazing the the labor history that's right here in this state in this big fat red state mm-hmm. that needs to turn purple and they're always denigrating <laughs> labor they always act as if yeah. labor, labor never did anything here right and, and won't do anything in the future but and the truth is uh labor built this the state 
Almost everything progressive came out of organized working people. Okay, y'all hear true, that? <laughs> I mean, I say that all the time, but it sounds like an overstatement. Almost every progressive advance in the way we live came because working people got organized. Right. Let's, no, I just want to check that with the professor. That's, no, yeah. I, I think that's a pretty fair statement. I mean, there are other reform efforts that come out of the middle class that um, – are kind of designed to ameliorate the, the worst conditions of the working poor. Mm -hmm. Those tended to run into conflict with the working people who they were trying, trying to, help. to help. And uh, and and working people had their own visions for what those programs should look like and, and forced those upon upon the middle class reformers. So I would say throughout history that it's a pretty fair statement um, that that most of our progressive legislation of one kind or another, most of the the more sort of humane working conditions or better human relations or any of it is a result of a, a push from the bottom up among working people. Uh, you know, and, and that also includes, I think, the civil rights struggles. Okay, is everybody listening out there? Are you hearing that? That means there's more of us than there are of them. So you need to register and vote and get busy. Let's I used to say, get up, get out, and get involved. This is a big opportunity for KNON listeners to, to talk to someone who actually knows some history and can actually document what he says and not just talking. He's not making this stuff up, yeah. okay? So call us at 972-647-1893 if you have a question. Uh, or if you have a comment, a lot of people knew Pancho and they've got yeah. their own stories, for example, just about Pancho Medrano. And, and a lot of people know other uh, heroes that sacrificed and uh, made, a, made a difference in their lives, especially through organizing working people. Exactly. So call us at 972-647-1893 if you're interested. Tony's on the line. Let's All see right. what Tony, hey, Tony. Tony has to say. Thanks for calling, Tony. How y'all doing this morning? Good yeah, morning. we're doing good. All, all right. Um, what I want to add to the conversation is this. If you look at numbers, I've always been more Democrat than Republican. Mm -hmm. Number two is, I mean, this is my personal opinion and my personal observation. I think, I, I think the problem we have is that we have right now the numbers to vote a Democratic governor right now. Mm -hmm. Bannock is so? black and, 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 and the number of white... The numbers are already there. The problem yeah, but, is, go ahead. Yeah, but Tony, everybody keeps saying the the Republicans are ahead by something like 17 points. Mm -hmm. So how can that be if there are more Democrats than there are Republicans? Well, the gentleman sitting there right next to you can tell you, Hispanics don't vote their numbers. Uh huh. If they vote their numbers, as they number in the population, which is uh, is the majority now, and if they I was listening to you talking about the Bedranos. They going to be a low hanging fruit as far as the city council and all that. Won't you go for governor? I mean, at, at some point, you, you got to leave your base and that and, and, and that net that, that guarantee net that, that you have in your district and say, hey, I am a person that I think I can run for governor or a high state. But mm -hmm. the, the problem is, a lot of banks probably don't want, to, want me to say this, but we probably gonna elect the first Hispanic governor before we elect the black governor. Uh -huh. So you have all these Hispanics, you have all these Hispanics who yeah. what, who have who have, are, are in um, in office. One of them have to get a chance to say, "Hey, I'm tired. Let me run and let me get a black coalition, not just a black coalition, a, 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 a better coalition of the people in the union, people who are poor, and quit playing around trying to get these low hanging fruit." Yeah. And at the end of the day, like I say, right now the numbers right now. Today, you can vote a, a, a governor, a Democratic governor right now. With and, the Democrats so, so messed up. Tony, so you know, the, the people who are the least likely to have voted are in Texas are African Americans. That, that's true. That, 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 but no. And, you I'll know, I, I know, I mean, you do. And, and we have to encourage our brothers and sisters to understand that their vote does count, that it does make a difference. And, and if they want a voice in what's going on, you have to vote. And, and don't let this, this, all these laws that, they're, that they've passed to, to try to uh, take the vote away from us and suppress the vote, we have to fight back. There's already been a lawsuit filed uh, and, 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 by the Justice and, and, Department. And, 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 and you're right. The thing is this. I don't, I'm telling you, and this is my personal opinion again, I don't hear the West Wesses. I don't hear the, the, all the black leadership. Now, they give a good talk about it organization, but at the end of the day, they have their own little 
kingdom, as long as they're comfortable in that, they're going to do what they do. But at the end of the day, like you're saying, we don't vote our numbers too. Now, my, my, my argument to the people who don't vote is this. The ones who are on welfare, you get mad when they cut your welfare check, but you don't vote. Mm-hmm. The, right. the guys who get 25 to life in jail get mad because the judge getting 25 to life. That's a, you can elect your judges. But guess what? We don't talk to these people like that. Like, you know, you are a part of the system. And any part of it is based on voting. If you don't vote, that man should get to the, give you 25 to life. You can't get mad at him because guess what? You, just <laughs> you didn't vote. vote. You're right. And I'll leave y'all with that. And thank you for letting me uh, air my opinion. Thank you, Tony. You're awesome. Thanks. Uh, well, it's about time we stopped uh, getting mad and started thinking about getting even. No kidding. <laughs> Let's let Max talk on this. Uh, okay. Well, thanks, Tony, for your call. I thought that was a number of great comments in there. Um, so from a historical perspective, this isn't a new question. right? The numbers have been there for a very, very long time, and there's been a tremendous amount of optimism about the numbers going back a very long time. In fact, I look at documents from the 1950s, and it's amazing to read the Democratic Party discussions about how the growing Latino population is inevitably going to lead to the transition of this state into the liberal column, you know, and, and that the, they were very optimistic and they said, oh, it's just going to happen. And, and it didn't. Right. Um, and, and so I, I, I always caution people whenever they're talking about the current demographic trends to, 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 to think that these demographics are not, in fact, destiny. And instead, it has to be organized. And and. We have historical precedent for that as well. In, in the 1960s, which was really the breakthrough period for uh, for the liberal wing of the Democratic Party, what is now our Democratic Party, um, in the beginning in 1963, they launched a, a massive multiracial coalition aimed at, at voter registration on an unprecedented scale. And from 63 forward for the next about 15 years, made tremendous amount of progress registering voters, winning people, uh, winning elected office, uh, you know, getting good candidates from from all different groups and, and really making a huge amount of, of impact. And in fact, by the you know, 1970, 71, those legislatures are passing a, a huge amount of pro- progressive legislation sort of led by labor. Uh, but also fueled by all the different African-American and, and Mexican-American community organizations in, in all the big cities. Uh, so it, while it's true that people aren't voting in their numbers, that's always been, been true. And it's also something that we've seen can be solved if you put enough people on the ground. And, and that's what they did in the 1960s. Uh, other point I just wanted to make was that you mentioned that, that these Medranos and others are, are, are kind of going after the low-hanging fruit of local office. Um, on the one hand, I think that's really a significant fruit, right? The, the, the fact that they're winning these positions is new in, in American history. It's only something that's been possible since the late 70s. A tremendous amount of blood, sweat, and tears went into it. And, and that's a really significant chunk of political power that does trickle down to those communities and has really transformed the cities in which we all live. Um, but on the other hand, the, the point that they should run for higher office, I think, is well taken. And, um, you know, the question right now is how does the Democratic Party get out of simply holding office in minority opportunity districts in urban areas and start thinking about um, how do you build a, a coalition that can win on the statewide level? Uh, I, I think that can happen. I think it can happen relatively soon. Uh, if the resources are there and if there's enough bodies, people on the ground that are really going out and, and doing the voter registration and, and are turning people out to vote. But the other piece of that is that the, the, the slate on top needs to be diverse uh, and there needs to be a slate and they need to all run together. Uh, and and they, they came close to this at, at different places in the 60s and 70s. I think we can learn from those moments. Um, right now, I think if, if Wendy Davis, who I love, she's my state senator, right? if Wendy Davis runs by herself, she's not got a great chance. But if we can, uh, if the Democrats can build a ticket that is um, Davis, that it includes prominent uh, Mexican Americans, prominent African Americans, uh, representatives of the LGBT community, Amen. Um, yeah. you know, th- that's a ticket that can win. And I, I think it can win not by appealing to the middle, but really by appealing to those core constituencies. That's 972-647-1893. Right. If you want to give your opinion, we'll be right back after this break. Close to me, 
Recycle Revolution is a local recycling collection service and community drop-off center. They collect and accept all traditional recyclables, including paper, plastic, aluminum, cardboard, and glass, as well as TVs, computers, lamps, light bulbs, batteries, ballasts, and styrofoam. They offer collection services to apartments, condos, and businesses. They also offer a community drop-off located at 1703 Chestnut Street in Dallas. For more information, 214-566-3025 or RecycleRevolutionDallas.com. The Sons of Herman Lost Disc Airmen Disc Golf Association and the Gas Pipe. The Gas Pipe, the Gas Pipe present the first annual KNON Disc Golf Tournament and After Party on Saturday, September the 7th. The tournament will be held at BD Owens Park located at 10700 Kingsley Road in Dallas beginning at 4 p.m. There will be goodie bags, games, an ace hole contest, poker run, and more. Then, beginning at 7 p.m., the party starts at the Sons of Herman Hall located at 3414 Elm Street in Deep Ellum with free food and live music by Texas Slim, Jay Johnson, and All Lit Up. To register, contact me, Hippie Bobby. Wilbanks at 972-658-8577 or go to knom.org. Participants of the disc golf tournament are admitted free into the after party. If you just want to go down to the show, you can get tickets at knom.org. That's the first annual KNOM disc golf tournament and after party on September the 7th at B.B. Owens Park in the after party with Texas Slim, Jay Johnson, all lit up and free dinner at the Sons of Herman Hall. Presented by the Sons of Herman Hall, Lost Disc Airman Disc Golf Association and the Gas Pipe, the Gas Pipe, the Gas Pipe. This is a KNOM benefit fit event. I wake up in the morning at 4.45 The alarm clock is relentless for goodness sakes alive Back to the old barnyard the Monday morning grind If the boss man I'm walking a thin, thin line. line. Walking a thin line. Yeah, you don't want us to sing. Trust me. Nine seven two six four seven one eight nine three is the number, and K N O N really loves it when you call. You know, uh, Gene, I just wanted to thank everybody uh, for all their pledges, and if you haven't sent it in, don't forget. Uh, and, and you know, thanks for getting us to our goal, so we didn't have to do pledge drive again today. Oh, yeah, that's cool. Yeah. Uh, the thermometer's down. I know. I well, it's, it's like normal again. <laughs> they must have finished the thermometer out. <laughs> well, we're, we're fortunate today to be talking with uh, someone who knows stuff about history. Knows and stuff. Uh, Max, is there any particular things you'd like to bring up? Because we're, we're, on the, we're on the cusp of a historical period right now, are we not? Yes. Are you aware that the AFL-CIO is going to have its convention next month mm -hmm. and that they are inviting input from the, from the entire country, not just union really? members, but from everybody, and that this is a historical turn? So looking, looking forward, uh, I think we can see some really exciting things happening in the organized worker movement. But looking back, <coughs> people often ask, and the AFL-CIO has been asking, where did we go wrong? What mistake was made? And this is what I love to talk about. Oh, oh, pick me, pick me. Okay, Bonnie wants to tell us what we did wrong. Well, I, I, it's the good old boy syndrome. I'm sorry, but it's still the good old boy syndrome to this day. They, you know, women, uh, there's not a lot of women, although we make up most of the workforce. Uh, there's not a lot of color, even though they make up a lot of the workforce. It's it is still the good old boy. You're my you know, buddy. Was, You're next running. in line. All right, Max. Was it ever better? Was the, was there a period in time when the American labor movement uh, was more was less uh, going in the direction of the good old boys and more going in the direction of being inclusive? Um, no. Okay. <laughs> the, the, the short answer is no. The, uh, at least when we're talking about the AFL-CIO and its origins, it you know but we, the AFL-CIO only started in what '55 or something well, like that. Well, so the C, the right the merger was in '55. The CIO was spawned off in '35, mm -hmm. uh, and the AFL goes back to 1886. But the the in ge in general, you know, organized labor. There, there's different strands. So there are the people like Pancho Madrano, and there's lots like him, right? Mm -hmm. African Americans, Mexican Americans, women who have charted out these remarkable paths as organizers and leaders of the labor movement on the local level, sometimes at the regional or state level, and and they've really put forward a much more expansive agenda about what labor should be. 
and, and, and ordinary working people of color, ordinary working women have done the same thing throughout history. Um, you know, take and, and they're and they're tied with the with the movements I've been talking about. But institutional labor at, at the top, it's always been male. It's always been white. It's almost always been go. native born. That's uh, not, and that's even not fair because and even no, at the, it's at not. It's, in '95, the, at the top, uh, uh, Linda Chavez Thompson broke that glass ceiling. She did. And, and Arlene uh, Holt Baker yeah. is is there. Uh, and there's two of them now, aren't they? At the top leadership. Arlene's Arlene. Arlene's not. She's not. She's leaving. Yeah, I know she's leaving, but there well, were two vice presidents that were women. Sure, so and, and you're talking about the very at the very top. Right. Well, right. And so, it, it, I mean, it is a mixed picture. Mm-hmm. Um, but, but, can we say it's always been a good old boys club to some degree? Sure. Now, there there have been other experiments. Um, uh, take the Knights of Labor of the 1880s, which was an industrial union uh, and one that organized in all different ways. It organized. Uh, local by local, like labor does today, but it also organized communities. It might have an African American local, it might have a Polish local, it might have a women's local, and it, it was it included everybody except for Chinese on the West Coast, which is a different story. Mm-hmm. But uh, you know, and at its height, it had I think over ten percent African American members. And this is in the 1880s, and they had interracial meetings. They, they had, had a black a, vice president. Yeah, they had an interracial march uh, down the streets of Richmond, the mm-hmm. cradle of the Confederacy, in the 1880s. So just 20 years after the Civil War, um, wow. and and here in Texas, African Americans joined in the great southwest railroad strike and so there are many many examples and and the rise of the cio in the 1930s the congress of industrial organizations was another opportunity when um the door was opened much more so for people of color for women in the labor movement and they took on leadership roles uh and, and and as the labor movement really boomed in the 30s and 40s it boomed at the moment it was the most inclusive the uh, cio would never have succeeded with industrial organizing if they had if they had continued uh, the racist policies of the previous right. unions right because when you're uh, organizing industrially means everybody in the shop mm-hmm. that means you have to let the guys with the broom in just as much as the guys with the electrical tool belt right. tool belt and uh, so the so the CIO and especially the auto workers mm-hmm. broke through that racist barrier and organized industrially, organized everybody in the shop into the same union, which was kind of a unknown idea. Well, and it wasn't just race as we think about it now, but it was also ethnicity among people we would all consider white now, right? But that uh, the AFL unions in steel in particular had long been an exclusive province of sort of the older stock of European immigrants of the English, the Germans, the Irish had made it in as foremen by, by the 1930s. Uh, but the, the Eastern Europeans, the Slovaks, the, the Italians, the Jews, they weren't welcome either. Right. And, and of course the African Americans were not, or me- and, and Mexican Americans where they worked in the industry. And, and so what happened was every time they went out on strike, these people just kept working because they didn't they weren't welcome in the union they weren't welcome in um the communities and and so the company was able to bust the unions over and over again and it wasn't until the 30s with the steel workers organizing committee which then uh and, and the united mine workers which spawned the uaw that that uh workers started organizing in this industrial manner and started coming together across ethnic and and racial lines and and sexual lines to sure and, and religion was the other mm-hmm. major dividing point so so the cio represented a gigantic step forward for the labor movement yeah. beginning officially in 1935 but there were there were people for decades before that that had been trying to push for industrial organizing of course the industrial workers of the world that was their main uh, argument, was mm-hmm. that uh, we had to organize industrially. Right, and then the mine workers were the other place. I mean, when you're underground, it doesn't matter if you're black or white. And, um, right. you know, one one mine worker in an interview said, you know, the, that we always said that when the boss is kicking butt, he doesn't care if it's a black butt or a white butt, right? So they found ways to get together because they were in this dangerous situation. They needed to depend on one another. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and so... Uh, when the CIO forms officially in the 30s, it's it's the mine workers' leader John L. Lewis that uh, is at the center of it. So the CIO was much more inclusive than the AFL had been prior to that time. Sure. And then during by the time they got to World War II, the AFL had also shifted, and many of the AFL unions were being more inclusive, and uh, the labor movement had a bright future. But something happened, uh, something went wrong, and I I lay this off on the Treaty of Detroit. I lay it off on the time that the CIO uh, uh, more or less gave up on its social 
agenda and started becoming a exclusively a trade union organization. Well, th there's some truth to that. I mean, there, there are other factors, too. So one of the things that made the CIO successful in the 30s and 40s is that it, it included a huge number of talented organizers who also happened to be communists. And, uh, and they were good at their jobs. They were good at getting people motivated, bringing people together, helping people see what they had in common. And, and very inclusive. And very, very inclusive. I mean, way out in front of everybody else in race. Mm -hmm. uh, and 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 you know these unions that we see that were led by people of colors in, in the 30s that were led by women tended to be the ones that also had a strong left uh, communist influence um, and and it was kind of a homegrown communism it wasn't coming from Russia you know there's a, a, a union in North Carolina that was led by black women and they uh, spawned off a, a local unit of the Communist Party and at the beginning of every meeting they held a prayer right so this was a local southern communism it wasn't coming from Russia but in any event it, this is what helped produce some of that dynamism and solidarity within within the labor movement and so when, with the coming of World War II several things take place one is that uh, the, most of the CIO unions agree not to strike for the duration of the war, and um, and that they separates. Wanted to win the war. Well, they wanted to win the war, but the the the, the downside was that it separated the la the leadership of those unions from the rank and file, and it meant that the leadership had the role of policing the members of the unions and making sure that they wouldn't go on strike. Mm -hmm. So that helped to kill a uh, sense of solidarity there. It helped to separate that leadership from the base, um, and so that was that contributed to the loss of dynamism within the movement. Coming out of the war, uh, you know, we see the, the origins of, of anti-communism, the second round of anti-communism and Red Scare in America, and, and the CIO kicks out all of the unions that have communist members uh, in, it, in their leadership. They force the unions to purge all of the communists that they have on the inside, or, and then the passage of the Taft-Hartley Act in 1947 adds a legal basis to that where um, uh, the, the unions that have communists in their leadership um, can no longer get the protection of the National Labor Relations Board for representation elections, for bargaining, whatever it might be. So those things happened. Um, so we see the separation from the leader uh, you know, of the leadership and the rank and file. We see the the uh, the loss of this dynamic set of organizers who have this communist political philosophy, but are also interracial and inclusive and very good organizers. And and so the the movement aspects are are diminishing in those ways. And then, as you said, the Treaty of Detroit. Uh, which is a third major shift. Um, you know, coming out of World War II, the United Auto Workers had a very big vision for the future. Walter Ruther, who was the president of the UAW, had come out of the rank and file. He uh, demands that the that General Motors open their books up to the union and that the unions not only bargain like they do today, but actually help manage the company and that they have some control over the, un the company's finances. Uh, you know, he says... He, um, right, so that the, they they have workers' control not just on the shop floor but on bigger corporate affairs. So this idea of industrial democracy was vibrant. Well, hmm. they went on strike in '46. It was disastrous. By 19, they ha they end up signing a contract that does not include that that protects management rights. All of you have management rights clauses in your contracts. This is where it comes from. That strike wave that that the workers lost and that management said we have control of the company. We'll give you wages. We'll give you benefits, but we keep control of the company. And they signed a number of these contracts, and by 1950, uh, UAW signed contracts with the major automakers. They called it the Treaty of Detroit. It was a five-year contract for the first time. It, it produced pattern bargaining for the entire industry. It was the best package you've ever seen in your life, right? High wages, good benefits, retirement, health care, all these different things that they, workers had really never had before. Um, but it did not include workers' control over the company in any meaningful way. It did not include the industrial democracy components. And so I think it was Forbes magazine, or maybe it was Fortune, you know, they reported that General Motors spent a billion dollars for labor peace and got a bargain, right? Because they didn't give up the control. And, and for his part, Walter Ruther said, it's no longer about a bigger piece of the pie. We just want a bigger pie. And we're gonna, we're gonna help assist the growth of the American economy, the growth of American imperial ventures abroad. And, uh, and there was labor peace by 1950, uh, left out of that was some of the original goals of the movement. And then, and then, prior, and then after that, uh, you saw a growing separation between the organized sector of the working class and the rest of the working class, mm -hmm. because the CIO gave up uh, its program to build Social Security and instead started getting uh, started getting. Uh, pension benefits from companies and then they they gave up on national health care which they could have they were very close to getting it just as the other industrialized nations got it at the end of world war ii and instead they started getting 
for union members only right. uh, uh, health care through <coughs> their employers. Yeah, I think that's one of the most important points, and we often forget that, that the the the, the mess we're in today with health care is, is, is an outgrowth of this segmenting of the workforce where there's a union workforce that gets good benefits, and then there's everybody else that's left out in the cold. Mm -hmm. And we, we did have a universal option on the table back then. And, and instead of developing a public welfare state with universal benefits and pensions like every other industrial democracy did, we, we set up a hybrid public-private version where the private sector side did well, and, and unions were part of that, and everyone else was left out. And people thought, well, this is great because what the heck, we've got 35% of the workforce organized and we're going to get the rest of them. That's right, and everything's going to be they wonderful. Didn't. But right. they didn't. Uh, that Went separation the between the organized sector mm -hmm. and everybody else resulted in a downward spiral. Yeah. And you could see this from, say, 56 on. Mm -hmm. uh, you could see the unions slowly but surely losing uh, their share of the workforce well, and until the, today it's uh, below 14 percent and the other part of it was about race right so that in in right after world war ii there's an attempt to organize workers in the south it it's called operation dixie it fails largely because of divides along racial lines and and the way that the cio responds is by d trying to downplay racial issues which is not what built it in its first place. Instead, Did it fail, Max, um, or was it just given up on? Well, it was also given up on. And, and, then, and then later efforts to organize in the 50s were always hampered by the fact that the unions were defending seniority systems that often reflected or, or reinforced older racist employing, employment practices. And, and so it made it harder for them to keep organizing in the, in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. Well, so, it, the, so the fight for civil rights that was a core part of the CIO and one of the main reasons that the CIO existed, the one, the, the, one of the main reasons that it had succeeded, mm -hmm. was simply given up on. Uh, in the late 1940s. Right. Although there are lots of individuals within the movement who keep up that fight, right? Mm -hmm. People, you know, the, the organizers, the rank Including and file. In Texas. Right, the, the Pancho Medranos of the world that, right. that keep that larger vision and keep pushing it forward. The, the, by the 50s, they're, they're, not, um, they're not running the show. Another good friend of mine from the old days is Roy Evans. Can you, uh, can you talk about Roy Evans' role? Well, sure. Um, just quickly, Roy Evans came again out of the same local here in, in, in Grand Prairie, the, the aircraft local of the UAW. My local. Right? My local. And, that would be Gene's local. And now local 848. And, uh, and well, I, I, you know, I'm, I don't know all of Roy's biography, but I can say that he eventually um, is elected secretary treasurer and then later president of the state AFL-CIO. Uh, and, and throughout that tenure, did, you know, really did emphasize building coalitions with, with people of color. Um, he, he was an outspoken advocate for progressive legislation. He went toe-to-toe -to -toe with many governors uh, in fighting for working people of all colors and, and uh, had quite a good record on that front. We've been talking with Max Croc Krokmal Very good. of, of uh, Texas Christian University, uh, and we need to have Max on more often. Wouldn't you say so, Bonnie? Yes, he has a, a positive. It's not all gloom and doom. Oh. There's, there's plenty of that, though. <laughs> oh, yes, yes. <laughs> you know, but at least you have the upbeat side that you're presenting, which you is know, good. I only got halfway through all the stuff that's going to be wow. coming up. Uh, next Saturday, the 31st, at Texas Theater at 10 o'clock, Texas Theater is in a 200 block of West Jefferson. Uh, there'll be a number of Labor Day events with uh, Congressman Mark Vesey. Uh, but to, on, the, on the day after August 28th, on August 29th, there will be a nationwide strike for fast food workers. That's right. So if you're a fast food worker, there's supposed to be a nationwide strike there's a, on Thursday. It's on, it's, uh, oh, and I didn't bring the address. Mm -hmm. They have it's an a, online organizing you know, kit. Yeah, yeah, there's Jack, there's the, there's a large action supposed to be at a Jack in the Box on, I want to say Central Expressway. Okay, we got to go. All right. Thanks, guys. Whole, See you next week. more stuff to read. Thanks, Max. Thanks, Bonnie. Thank and you. thank you for listening. KNON 89.3 FM in Dallas and Fort Worth, the voice of the people. Business owners, tell KNON's listeners about your business. You can put your business or event on KNON. KNON currently has space available to run announcements for you. Tell KNON's listeners about your goods, services, nightclub, concert, or event. Help keep the voice of the people on the air while putting your information on the air. KNON's been named the number one radio station in Dallas by both the Dallas Observer and D Magazine. Put your business with Dallas's number one station. Call now for more information at 214-828-9500, extension 227 or extension 233. For more information, go to KNON.org and click on the Run Spots on KNON page. It's a great way for your business to support community radio while letting more people know about you.